Recording in progress. Morning. Good morning to you. How are you? I'm good. Good. How was your weekend? Oh, pretty good. That's good. Mostly recovered from my cold. Oh, yeah. How was yours? It was incredible, actually. My birthday was Friday, oh. and I just figured it would just be a, you know, whatever, normal birthday, but my folks got with all of my friends and threw me a big surprise party oh, nice. which i've never had a surprise party so that was pretty neat <laughs> i see a so it was really cool. my... in the background oh yeah <laughs> um yeah my sister flew up from texas and was there and it was it was really cool wow it was a neat nice. neat thing well how are the rest of you doing all three of you <laughs> Registering for classes. Oh no, your microphone is back to being fuzzy. It's like a weekly thing now. A registration opens at 10. Oh, cool. Yeah. It's that time of the year already, huh? Mm-hmm. Gonna do on ground classes this year. Whoa. Yeah, okay. it's gonna be interesting. This is the last CSCI class. This and 50 are the last ones that I need for my transfer. Very good. So, and then so, you get just other classes, right? Yeah, now it's just math and physics and lots of history and economics and business and all that other stuff. I'm trying to prepare the uh, template program for what we're doing today, and I've got errors all over the place. Just because it's the first time compiling it. Um, oh, okay. I want to get it relatively bug-free so that I actually bring it on the screen. It won't be too embarrassing. It's nice to know that that's, it doesn't only happen to us. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> oh, let's see. I oh, got another. Okay. Ah, there we go. Oh, that's one. Okay. So we're going to learn how to sort today. Be cool. Well, we, we've already seen a little bit of sorting. I've shown you bubble sort. Did I, did I actually write that one up? Mm -mm. I didn't. Nope. Okay. I well. we haven't done any sorting yet. Oh. Okay. We just saw like the uh, theory behind it. Okay. Um. <clears throat> Which, well, I guess we did a little bit when we did the uh, the games that we wrote, but those were a little tiny. Oh, that's you true. Know, store, store this in a temp and move stuff around and pop it where it's supposed to go. So did we end up? We didn't really end up sorting that, right? We just we we started it out with it sorted. Because no, we started out with it unsorted. We it was a uh, it populated numbers, and then we had to move stuff around. Oh, but we when we built the array, we built it sorted, and then we shuffled it. Yes, yes. So we, so we never correct. actually wrote a sorting routine for it. Mm -hmm. 
So the basic concept behind sorting is, well, first of all, there's many different sorting algorithms. There's like bubble sort, quick sort, merge sort, um, uh, um, radix sort. There's, there's dozens of different sorting algorithms. They all have different run times. So some of them are slower, some of them are faster. Some of them are more complicated to code up. Some of them are easier to code up. Uh, usually it turns out the slower ones are the easier ones to code up and the faster ones are the harder ones to code up. So we usually start with introducing something like bubble sort, which is really easy to write code for. It just tends to be a little bit slower. So the um, theory behind how, how bubble sort works is if, if this is our array here, is you run a loop that goes through this array from left to right, and it compares consecutive or adjacent pairs of elements. So it starts by looking at the first two, and then it compares those, and if they are in the wrong order, it then swaps them. So it would take this one, move it over here, take this one over here, and then over there. Okay, and then it moves to the next one. If those are in the wrong order, swap them. So we'll take this out, move this over, put this here. And then compare these two. If they're in the wrong order, swap them. And uh, did, I, did I swap them correctly? I think I didn't. <laughs> Sorry, let's go back to the beginning here. So it compares <laughs> these two. Those are in the right order, so we leave those. Compare these two, those are in the wrong order, so we swap them. Now, now I've got it. Okay, and then compare these. Those are in the wrong order. So, swap them. And then compare these. Those are in the wrong order. And then these. Those are in the wrong order. And then the last two, those are in the wrong order as well. And now you've made one pass through the array. And at the end of that first pass, the highest number has bubbled its way up to the top of the array, which is why it's called bubble sort. And then you just repeat that process over again. You look at the first two. If they're in the right order, you leave them. If they're not, you swap them. Okay, and we look at these. Wrong order. This is really easy to like teach to a kid how to do. Mm -hmm. you know, if you want, if you give them a deck of cards, and you teach them, if you want, I mean, normally the way you sort is the way a human probably sorts is doing something called insertion sort or selection sort, which is to maybe pull out one card, maybe the one on the top, and then try to figure out where it goes in the deck, and then pull out another card and try to figure out where it goes in relation to that first one. Right, either behind it or in front of it. And so you're inserting each card into the correct spot, and then um, you can sort a deck that way. Okay, compare these. Wrong order. And then you compare these two, they're in the right order, and you compare these two, they're in the right order. So you start it over again. All right, so this is basically how bubble sort works. All right, compare these, that's in the correct order. Compare these, that's in the wrong order. So move this. And then it's sorted. And then there, there, and there. And then what you do at this point is you make one last pass through to make sure nothing gets um, uh, swapped. So you compare these, nothing. Compare these, nothing, nothing. No change, no change, no change. And now you know it's sorted. So here's the program that I was working on right as we started the stream. Um, we've got a main that creates an array and then saves it by writing it to a file. And what make array does is it, uh, it, first of all, it seeds the random number generator and then it allocates an array of uh, a given length, fills the array with random numbers, in this case, a bunch of random floats, and then returns the array 
And then save array just simply opens a file for writing and then loops through, prints out the contents of the file and then closes it. So let's go ahead and run this program. And we've got this file. So 100 random floating point numbers. And we want to sort those. So in between creating the array and saving the array, let's write sort array. We'll pass in the array and the length. And let's do bubble sort on this. So easy way to do this is you're going to write two loops. One outer loop that um, runs the large passes through the array, and then a smaller loop that does each individual pass. So if you have an array with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven elements in it, um, you will need to make at most six passes through the array in order to sort it. It might be less, but you have to make at most six. Um, you know, consider if you have an array with three items in it. In order to sort this array, you'll have to make at most two passes through it. You have to make one pass which moves the three into the right spot, and then another pass that moves the two into the right spot, but then in the process of moving the two in the right spot, the one will also move into the right spot. Okay? So you need at most n minus one passes through the array where n is the size of the array. And then within each pass, you have to make n minus one comparisons, because you're doing pairs of, of numbers. So in this one here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six pairs that you have to compare. Here there will be one and just two pairs to compare. So n minus one passes through the array, and then n minus one comparisons within each pass. So here's my outer loop. I've got size minus one passes through the array. And then size minus one comparisons. And then we do our condition. If a bracket, in this case, uh, j, is um, greater than a j plus 1. So we look at the jth item and the j plus 1th item. Then we're going to swap them. And that's it. That's all of bubble sort. <laughs> very, very simple to code up. Uh, what did I do wrong here? Void sort array, float pointer A, sort array. Oh, I forgot to put void in front. There we go. It's always the little things. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at our output file. And we can see now it is nicely in order. OK. 
Okay, so any questions about that? Pretty straightforward, I think. Yeah. So let's write a, a very similar program, but this one will work on strings instead of floats. I'm actually just going to make a copy of this. And uh, in order to get a source for a bunch of strings, I'm going to copy over one of those rock you files that we were using. It's got a bunch of words in it that we can use. And then um, I didn't prepare for this, so we have to modify this in order to work with these files. So instead of uh, make array returning a, um, a pointer to floats, let's make it return a pointer to strings. And for save array, instead of uh, reading in a, an array of floats, it's going to read in an array of strings. Same thing with sort array, uh, an array of strings. So let's work on make array first. Let's see, so we've got our length. Why don't we just have it, here's what we're going to do, is we're just going to have it open up this rock you one million file, um, but just read in the first 2,000 of them and then stop. That way I don't have to change the file names as we, as we do this here. So we no longer need a random number generator, so we're going to pull that out. We're going to allocate the array. And um, why don't we just do an array of, array of, let's see, how should we do this? How should we do this array of strings? We could do it two ways. We, we learned how to do it two ways. We could just do an array of actual strings, or we could do an array of pointers to strings. Do you have a preference? Well, we know how to make an array of strings pretty easily, so we could go over pointers again. You want to do the pointer? So we could make something that looks like this. So we've got this array, bum, 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 bum. And then this one here points to some string, and this one points to some other string. Mm -hmm. This one points to some other string, right? Yeah, because creating just an array of words, is mm -hmm. that's like super simple. Okay. But doing this is a little more complicated, so it's nice to see. Okay, so that means we need to allocate an array of pointers to strings. So malloc a length times the size of character pointer. Okay, so each one of each one of these is a pointer to a single character, the character that's at the front of the string. Um, but what do we get back? We don't get back a character pointer. We get a character pointer pointer. Yes. Right, so we get back something that points to this thing. And this thing here points to a character pointer. So this is a character pointer pointer. Now, fill array with strings. So we are going to um, open the rock you file. For reading.
check to see if we actually were able to open it. And now that we've got it open, we can start filling it with strings. So we're going to go from 0 up to our length. And here this is going to change. So we're going to read in one line, strip off that new line. Um, that's supposed to be a character line, let's say 100. We know that's way more than we need. And then we'll strip off that new line. our standard find and uh, zap the new line character by replacing it with a null. <clears throat> so now we have our password sitting in this array called line. And we need to now copy that into one of these things here. So we need the length of the line plus one, one for the new line character. and then copy it in. Uh, copy string, copy line into the new string, and then attached to array of strings. So a sub i is equal to that a, a, let me make sure that's right, array, array a, yes, that's this one here. Array a is equal to str. Okay, I think that's it. So we allocate space for each string, copy it in, attach it to the array of strings, and then we can return that array. I don't have to return the length because I know what the length is. I set that at the very top of the program as a define. Oh, uh, before we return the array, we need to close the file. Okay, and then I need to, let's see, let's, let's not do sort array just yet. We're going to, let's see, we need to make that character. This is character pointer pointer. Link, link, make array. Save array needs to be character pointer pointer. Open the file for a re, uh, output, and then loop to the size, f print out. This needs to be percent %s, and then everything else is, <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> Nothing much there changed, just had to change the type there, and then change this to an s, because we're outputting strings. And then for now, I'm going to comment out uh, sort array, because we are not ready to do that yet. Okay, so let's let's go over the changes. Let's see, we made a make array return a character pointer pointer, and save array uh, takes in a character pointer pointer. Don't need sort array just yet. In main, the array is a character pointer pointer. 
in make array, oh, this needs to be character, pointer, pointer, uh, we allocate the array of the given length, and then we open the input file. I know some of you are following along, so I'm also doing this so you can go and double check all your code. Um, and it's also good for me to just kind of walk through it in my head and make sure that at least uh, the pieces all seem to be there. Okay, so we're going to uh, uh, count from zero up to the length. We're going to allocate space for a line. We're going to, uh, oops. Uh, ooh. I'm we never gonna, get a line. Yeah, I, I never, was wondering I never, if we were going to change that to a while up gets. Um, I don't want to use a while in here because I'm not reading the whole file in. I'm only reading in the first hundred words. Mm, so gotcha. I'm just going to use fgets right here. Line 100 in. It's a good thing I walked through this. Trim off the new line. Allocate space for the string. Copy the line into the new string. Attach it to the array. Close the file. Return the array. Good. And then in save array, nothing much changed here. We just change this type and we change this one. So just to reiterate here, the reason why I'm not using a while f get s is because I don't want to read the entire file in. I just want to read in the first hundred lines. And I'm opening up a file that has a million lines in it, so I know I've got plenty. All right, let's, uh, let's give it a shot. Oh, I, I made off pretty good. <laughs> I'm only missing the string.h header at the top. And I no longer need this time one because we're not doing random numbers. Hey, all right. Let's run it. And here's our output file. And that's it, right? It, we haven't sorted it yet, but it now contains just 100 lines of that file. And just to verify that things are working, let's change this length to 200. Recompile the program, run it, and then we'll look at our output file. And there's now 200 entries in it. Okay, so are we all kind of caught up? I think so. Now we're ready to sort this array. What changes do we have to make? At least to the declaration of the function. Back. Sorry. Um, well, we need to change what it's looking for. So oh. it's going to search for a character rather than so do we have a to, number. Do we have to change anything in the declaration? Oh. Well, that's a float. We don't want a float, right? Yeah, we're not sorting floats anymore. So when sort array takes in the whole array, what is it being passed? An array of characters? No, it's being passed. Yeah. No. Is it the pointers? So we're going to pass it this array. Ah, so the pointers. So pointer pointers. So we're going to pass in. Pointer pointers. Character pointer pointer. Then we can uncomment this. Now the way we call the array with just passing in the array and the length, that doesn't change. And then down here for sort array, this has to match character pointer pointer. 
we still have the same loops. We're still going from i to the zero to size minus one for both the i and the j loops. It's just right here and right in here where we have to make some changes. So if we are looking at the jth string and the j plus one string, how do we see if they're in the correct order or not? If we use less than or greater than, we're not comparing the string itself, we're comparing the pointers. And we're just seeing is the numeric value of this pointer uh, greater than the numeric value of this pointer, which is not what we want to do at all. But string compare will return. Yes. So we need to use, want. in this case, since we're using strings, we have to use string compare. And this would be the same thing you have to do in Java, right? In Java, you can't use less than or equal to either. What it would do in that case is do pointer comparisons. It would say, is the address for this string greater than the address for this string? And again, it's probably not what you want to do at all. So we need to replace this with string compare. We'll pass in the uh, j, uh, jth string and the j plus 1 string. And then how do we see if they are in the correct order or not? String compare will return 0 if they are equal to each other. It'll return a positive number if the first argument comes after the second argument. And it'll return a negative number if the first argument comes before the second argument. So, so if it's positive, if it's greater than 0. So if it's greater than 0, good. So if, if the jth string comes alphabetically after the j plus 1 string, we know that we need to swap them. Uh, what needs to change inside here? So we're going to do a swap. Now the nice thing about using pointers is that if we want to, let's say, swap this one and this one, which are sitting right next to each other in the array, uh, we don't actually have to swap the contents of these. Right? I don't have to actually copy the characters out of this string into some temporary location and then copy the characters out of this one into here and then copy the temporary one into here. All I have to do is just change where these pointers are pointing to. I'll just make this pointer point to this one and make this pointer point to this one. And I've effectively swapped the strings. The temp variable is just going to be a character pointer. Each one of these is a character pointer. So we copy the address that's in the jth element of the A array into temp, and then we copy the address out of the j plus 1 element into the jth element, and then we copy the address that we stored away in temp into the j plus 1 element. And that's it. Uh, remove the other comment character, <laughs> and then we should be good to go. And look at that. All in, well, all in ASCII order, mm -hmm. right? The, the numbers come first in the ASCII character set. And then one thing to notice about the numbers is they're not in numeric order at all. One, two, three, four, five, numerically does not come after one, 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 one. Right? Because this is not treating them as numbers, it's treating them as words. That's actually so an, could... an important thing to keep in mind anytime you're dealing with numbers and strings is that you fundamentally have to treat strings differently than you treat numbers when you're doing comparisons. I was just going to ask, can you just like use regular expressions to check like if it starts with a 1 through 9 or a 0 through 9, then treat it differently than if it doesn't? 
Um, yeah. Or yeah, you, you could just do, point you do regular expressions to see if all of the characters in your string are all digits. Well, Maybe. some of them start with numbers and end with letters. Like like what? There was one, two, three, A, B, C. Oh, oh, so you could treat the, like the numeric portion of it as a number. Yeah. Oh, so then you'd have to like split it apart into these. Yeah, numbers. that's, yeah. that'd, that'd be get, tricky. That'd be a little complicated. That'd be fun though, yeah. But, be fun though. I mean, these sorts of features, someone has thought about that. If you go into, I, I, actually, I know this works on the Mac. I don't know if it works on Windows, but if you go into the Mac and you create a bunch of files that have numbers as names, like, like you've created, um, like image files, you know, 1.jpg, 2.jpg, 3.jpg, it'll actually put them in numeric order. <laughs> mm -hmm. even it though, does it on PC too. Even though it, they're actually words, right? Because they end in mm -hmm. dot, dot .jpg. And if you call them like image 1, image 2, image 3, it still puts them in numeric order. So they've done some pretty smart stuff to split it apart into the words and the numeric portions and then sort them accordingly. Yep, I save all my stuff with dates. I put in the date first. And then it sorts it accordingly, but then it also will move into the letter sometimes. And even though it's the same date, it'll end up being not what I want because the letters are the way they are. But yeah, it does it in Windows too. And you used to have to do a little trick where if you wanted them to sort numerically, you would, and, um, but it, we knew that it wasn't actually sorting numerically, it was sorting them in ASCII order. Then you'd have to do this little thing where you'd call them like image 001 and image 002. So you have to put <laughs> yeah. the zeros in front in order to get mm -hmm. all those numbers to be the, the same uh, width, and then it would sort them what appears to be numerically. But now you don't have mm -hmm. to do that little trick anymore. Mm -hmm. You can leave the zeros off and it will still do the sort. So that's a much more intelligent sort, sort than <laughs> what we're doing here at all. <laughs> but it's something to think about. I don't think it would be that hard to... I mean, it would just be conditionals, right? It'd be a few conditionals yeah. to make sure that it... I mean, some of the edge like cases I can think about is what if there's like alternating letters and numbers in the file name? Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> what do you do suck. then? Right? <laughs> yeah. And do, do you treat the file names differently if they start with numbers versus the numbers being in the middle versus them being at the end? Ah, right. uh, yep. You might ask, what would a human do in that case? And then maybe mimic that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So as far as sorting the array goes, not much was changed. The only thing that we really had to change was the type of the array being passed in and the type of the temporary value. Everything else was pretty much the same. Oh, and, and the third thing was how we did the comparison. So those three pieces have to be adapted for how you're actually going to be, uh, what you're going to be sorting in the array. Everything else is pretty much the same. The actual algorithm itself is the same. What would happen if we switched this around to being, what's that? I'd do it in reverse order. That's easy. So if you want to sort an array in reverse order, you just switch that comparison around. You don't have to do anything other fancier than, like, than that. You don't have to do anything like run through the array backwards <laughs> or anything like that. You just switch the comparison. And then it will naturally put it into the opposite order. Okay, so the important thing there is that the algorithm itself doesn't change but you have to declare the function a little bit differently, and then you have to do the comparison differently depending upon whether you're comparing strings or numbers, and you have to change the way it does the, the swap. And actually, the way it does the swap is, is not much different. You just have to change the type. What happens, let's see, what would happen if we make this bigger? Let's make it a thousand. So 
So it starts all the way at all zeros, and then if we zip all the way down here, let's make this 100,000. <laughs> it oh. takes a little bit longer. Oh, this one takes a bit longer. How long do you think this is going to take? I don't know. We're at what, 10 seconds now? 15 seconds, maybe? Hmm. Interesting. While that's running, I'm going to go back over to sort float. Let's do the same thing. Didn't expect this to take that long. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna stop this. It, clearly, it's taking a long time. This one takes a long time too. Well, so while this is running, let's try to figure out what's going on here. So the way bubble sort works is it compares successive pairs of numbers in there. And we already calculated that we have to make n minus 1 passes through the array, and each pass is going to take n minus 1 comparisons between pairs of numbers. So if we have an array with 100 elements in it, we have to make 99 times 99 comparisons. Let's just round that up to 100. Okay. 100 times 100 is 10,000. So we have to do 10,000 comparisons. So we're doing 10 million comparisons now. Oh, if we're doing 100,000, what's 100,000 times 100,000? I think it's 10 million. Is it 10 million? Oh, it finally finished. Let's see. You want me to look at it? <laughs> Oops. Uh, two. One times 10 to the 10th. 100 million, or 10 million. 10 million? Yep. So we ended up having to do 10 million comparisons. You know, which for a fast computer is not, not that much. But part of doing all this, also the comparisons, is in addition to the comparisons, we also have to swap them, right? So there's also some memory accesses involved in, oh. in, in copying everything. Nope, I was wrong. 10 oh. billion. Oh, 10 billion. That makes more sense. Three, right? One, two, three. 100,000. Yeah, 10 billion. 100,000. You're right. It's 10 billion uh, comparisons. <laughs> and let's say half of those result in a swapping. Oh, man. So an additional 5 billion swaps. Each one of those swaps requires three memory copies, right? A copy, mm -hmm. in, a, a copy in a temporary a copy uh, from one array location to the other, and then a copy out of the temporary. So in addition to the 10 billion comparisons, we have roughly 15 billion memory copies. So that's a lot of work that the computer is doing. Yes. And then for the <laughs> strings, for the strings, 10 billion string compares. <laughs> now, we're not copying strings, we're just copying pointers. So again, 15 billion memory copies for the pointers, but still, that's that, the string compares probably take <laughs> a long time to do because you're yeah. comparing them one character at a time as you go through each one of those strings. Wow. So bubble sort is really easy to code up, but it's very slow. Let's take a look at quick sort. Quick sort is, well, it's quick, <laughs> and it, it uses something called a divide and conquer approach, where it basically, it takes the array, it splits it into half, and then it sorts each one of those halves. And the way you sort each one of those halves is you split them in half, and you sort those halves. So you filter all the way down, splitting, uh, cutting the array into halves, 
you sort each of those really tiny arrays and then you merge them back together. Actually, that's a description of merge sort. Um, but quick sort kind of basically does the same thing. Um, uh, if I can describe what quick sort does, it's, it's, it, it not only splits the array in half, it also leaves one element in the middle called the pivot. And then it takes all the elements on the left-hand side and the ones that are greater than the pivot, it moves over to the right-hand side. And on the right-hand side, all the ones that are less than the pivot, it moves over to the left-hand side. So it hasn't sorted them, but at least it's moved them into the correct spots. Like it's moved them, all the ones that are less than, onto the left-hand side and all the ones that are greater onto the right-hand side. So now we can say for sure that that pivot point is in the right spot because it, mm -hmm. it resides between all the ones that are less than and all the ones that are greater than. Mm -hmm. So after just one um, reorganization of the array, we now have one element in the right spot. And then we do the same thing for the left-hand side and the right-hand side. We split it in half, we have one pivot point, and then we move them back and forth around that pivot point. And then we do the same thing over here. And now, after two passes through the array, we have three of them in the right spot. We have the original okay. pivot, and then two more. Okay? And then we do the same thing again. We split them into halves. Now we got quarters going all the way through. And at the end of that third pass, we now have uh, seven of them in the right spot. So every time we make a pass through the array, we double the number of, of elements that are now in the right spot. Okay? Yeah, that's neat. All right, so, so what it means is that when we do uh, a log of n passes through the array, we have then sorted the whole thing, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, log is a lot smaller than n minus 1. Yeah, so instead of n squared comparisons, mm -hmm. we do log of n passes through the array, and then each array takes n, n comparisons to do. So we have n times log n comparisons to do. We still have to do comparisons. We still have to see if, if elements are in the right spot or if they need to be sent over to the other side. So that part doesn't change. But the number of comparisons we do is no longer n squared. It's now n log n. Mm -hmm. So that's basically quick sort. Quick sort. Every time you make a pass through the array, you double the number of elements that are in the right spot. Bubble sort. Every time you make a pass through the array, only one element goes into the right spot. Yeah. So the more passes, the quicker it gets. Yes. Or the bigger the array, mm -hmm. rel the relatively faster it gets. Yeah. So like with... Um, with bubble sort, if you have here, this is the, the number of elements, and this is the number of comparisons. It looks like it's, it's, just... it's a parabola, right? Yeah. This one here, it still it still slopes upward, but at a much less steep. Uh, much less steep slope. All right, so we are going to use, there's a built-in function called qsort that will do this for us. All mm -hmm. we have to do is just call qsort on the array, and it'll sort the array for us with a, a little bit of stuff that we have to do. Okay, so qsort is part of the standard library, so there's nothing else we have to include. Um, we're no longer going to call our own sort array. We're now just going to call qsort. Where's our main? Here. So we're going to take this out, and we're going to call qsort. Now with qsort, you have to pass in, uh, I think, four... Let's, let's take a look. We have to pass in... All right, let's take a look at this. So we have to pass in the array that we're going to be sorting. It's the first element. The number of items in the array. That'll be our length. The size of each element of the array. 
Why do we have to do that? Well, QSort is a general purpose sorting function. It works on arrays of anything. It works on arrays of integers, arrays of floats, arrays of strings, arrays of structures. Um, but in order for it to be able to work in a general way, it has to know um, not only how many elements are, but how big each element is, because it doesn't, in advance, at the time it was compiled, know those things. So we have to pass in the length of the array, the size of each element of the array, and then we also have to pass in a comparison function. We're going to write a, a, a function that teaches QSort how to compare pairs of elements. So over here in our program, we had to teach it how to do comparisons. For floats and integers, we can just use greater than. For strings, we had to use string compare. So that's the little piece of, the, of QSort that we have to supply so that it knows how to do the comparison. Okay, so let's start out with, with sort float. Let's do that one first. So let's, um, yeah, we're going to call QSort. So we call it on the array, the length of the array, the size of each element, which is a float, and then the name of a comparison function, which we're going to write in a moment here. Let's call it f compare for float compare. Okay, so when you are writing your comparison function, your comparison function needs to take in two void pointers and return an integer. All right, so this is, this is going to, I'm going to give you like a recipe. This is going to be a little bit tricky, but this is how you do it. So we go int f compare const void pointer a and const void pointer b. Okay, so first of all, the consts are here because we're not going to change the, the values of a and b. We're just going to simply use them for comparisons. Void pointer means a and b are just pointers to something. Okay, so when we are trying to sort our array of floats, we'll have A pointing to some element of the array and B pointing to some other element of the array. And then we're going to compare those two things and then tell it whether those are in the correct order or have to be swapped. So let's 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 see where should I put our f compare? Let's let's put it up here near the top just so that everything's kind of like together. Okay, so f compare needs to return a 0 if a and b are equal to each other. A negative number if A comes before B, and a positive number if B comes before A. So it's just kind of like string compare. <coughs> Return 0 if star A is equal to star B. Return positive, or we'll say negative, if star A is less than star B. And return positive if star A is greater than star B. So if the thing that A is pointing to is equal to the thing that B is pointing to, return a 0. If the thing that A is pointing to is less than the thing that a, B is pointing to, return a negative number. And if the thing that A is pointing to is greater than the thing that B is pointing to, return a positive number. Okay, so let's, let's do that. So if star A is equal to star B, return 0. Else, if star a is less than star b, return a positive, uh, sorry, a negative number. Let's go ahead and return negative one. 
else return a positive number. Okay, we're almost done. It's not going to compile. Why won't it compile? Well, because A and B are void pointers. But when I dereference A and dereference B, the compiler needs to know what are these things actually pointing to so that we can do this comparison correctly. All right? If A and B are actually pointing to integers, I need to do an integer comparison. If A and B are actually doubles, I need to do a double comparison, which is a different instruction in the, in the processor. So where does that go? Does that go in the F compare call? No. All we have to do is just cast A and B to be the correct thing. Okay, so A is a void pointer. Let's just cast it to be the right thing. So I'm going to say, uh, let's see now. So I know that A should actually be a float pointer. So it comes in as a void pointer, but it's actually a float pointer because in our function here, A is actually pointing to a float and B is actually pointing to a float. Let's just call it um, AA. -A. <laughs> and BB. Okay, so all we're doing is we're just casting A and B to be the correct thing. We know that they're supposed to be float pointers. They come in as void pointers because that's just the way the QSort function works. But we know they're supposed to be float pointers, so if we just cast them, then this will work. And I just changed the variables here to be A and B, B. So there's no way to write an overloaded version of this then, is there? No, because C doesn't have overloading. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> but, but this is basically, <laughs> this is basically what Java <laughs> generics has to do. Yeah. Is that if you have a generic function which uses the, the angle brackets, behind the scenes, it's just passing them in as object pointers, mm -hmm. and then it does a cast for you. Okay, that's cool. So when you use Java generics, it's just sort of writing this extra little code for you. Mm -hmm. it, um, it takes away, when it compiles the code, it takes away the angle brackets and replaces them with the types and then does these casts for you. Gotcha, okay. Which is why they were able to add Java generics without breaking any old code. Mm -hmm. Because it really just... Uh, what's called transpiles it, which means it just it just converts Java, old, new Java code to old Java code, and then okay. runs it as though it was old Java code. <laughs> okay, well, let's see if that works. So we're we're still doing a hundred thousand floats. Remember, the old one took about twenty seconds to run, maybe thirty. It took a while. That might have been yeah. close to a minute. Done. Dang. <laughs> a big difference. There they are, all in order. Yeah, <laughs> there's a huge difference. <laughs> right? So we went from 10 billion comparisons down to 100,000 times the log base 2 of 100,000. Not the log base 10, log base 2 of 100,000. Uh, 
Uh, what's the log base 2 of 100,000? It's the log of 100,000. <laughs> Why did it say 4? It's not 4. Um, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. 1, Is that the total number? Yep. 100,000 times? 100,000 times log 2 of 100,000 is uh, a million right 1.3 million so this would have been down from 10 billion <laughs> so from 10 billion to 1 million yeah <laughs> uh so that's what 10,000 times faster yeah what about the strings it'll be a little bit slower but probably not that much just because you have to compare all of the letters. So here we're going to take out our sort and we're going to call Q sort on the array, the length of the array, how big each element is, which, this, which is the size of a character pointer. And then our comparison function. So in this case, A and B are not pointing to floats. They're pointing to character pointers. So you need to cast it so as a, a character pointer. A is pointing to here, and B is pointing to here. So what type of thing is A? It's a pointer to a pointer. Yes, it's a character pointer pointer, because A is pointing to one of these things, which is a character pointer. So you really do kind of have to study your picture in order to see what these things are supposed to be. You, you can't just blindly say, Oh, it's, it's coming in as a void pointer, so it must be a character pointer, right? Just change void to character. Mm -hmm. No, they're coming in as void pointer, but they might actually be pointer pointers. Mm -hmm. Okay, and now we need to do that comparison. But it turns out string compare already returns the right, right kind of thing. Or returns zero or positive or negative. So we just need to return whatever string compare does. <laughs> That's easy. Okay. So we just call A, A, and B, B, but we need to dereference them because we need to go to the things that A and B are actually pointing to. Okay, just remember over here when we did sort float, we had to dereference A, A, and B, B. So over here, we still need to dereference them. Now, the last time we ran this with 100,000, I had to put it out of its misery. Oh, that's the one that took forever, yep. Yeah. <laughs> put it out of its misery. Ready? <laughs> Ready. Ready? Done. 10,000 times faster. So Boy. the last one uh, before I stopped it took a minute. And it wasn't even done yet. Yeah. You know, now we're looking at a hundred, oh, ten, one ten thousandth of a minute. Boy. So, you know, like a hundredth of a second. Yeah. That's amazing. Pretty incredible. That's why, like, the correct algorithm is so important. Mm -hmm. 
even though they do the same thing, one of them, just with a little change, like quick sort versus bubble sort, is a huge difference in the runtime. Yeah. Well, there they all are, in numeric order. Well, not numeric order, ASCII order. Boy, people speak some lousy passwords. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm selling the zeros here, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know why my scroll doesn't work. Oh, here we go. There we go. You can click on the uh, that little picture on the side too and scroll with that. This one? No, no, no. Yeah. The picture of you have like oh, a, here. the list. Yeah. This one. You can, oh. Yep. You can scroll with that. I'm all pointing at the screen. No, that one. The other <laughs> one. <laughs> like you can see it. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so, so that's basically how QSort works. Um, let's go back and see if we can clean this up again. So this is, uh, clean this up a little bit. So this is sort float here. And we, um, I mean, this works fine, right? We just have to cast it in the right spot. But some of you are probably thinking like, I hate this idea of making whole new variables. Now, when you turn on the optimizer, it probably will not make any difference whatsoever. The optimizer will see that the only time AA is used is to just simply cast A and so the optimizer will just slip the cast in correctly. Right? So don't worry about creating new variables. Um, but if you really feel like you have to do this, <laughs> what, what you're basically going to do is you're gonna, everywhere you see AA, you're just going to like uh, plop this thing in here. Right? And everywhere you see BB, you just uh, put this. And I got an extra set of parentheses to make sure the cast gets done first and then the dereference. And I'm actually not entirely sure if we need those parentheses. Ah, I don't know. I'm going to take them out, just see what happens. I bet the dereference happens first. It feels like that would be a precedence. We'll see. I'm curious. A parenthesis expected. Oh, I dropped off one. Still nicely oh, ordered. That worked. All right. Nice. No. All right, so now we don't need these. Cool. So the cast takes precedence over the cast that? takes precedence, yeah. Yeah. So it, it does the cast on A and then it dereferences it. Cool. And then as far as the string goes. Again, everywhere you see AA, just drop in what we had there before. Oops. Uh, sort string. There we go. And no problem there. Uh, somebody asked here, what's the time complexity of QSort when we're sorting a sorted array? So when you're sorting a sorted array with bubble sort, it just, um, well, the way we wrote it, it still takes n squared passes through the array. You could mm -hmm. put a little optimization in there that if you ever do a swap, then you set a flag. Mm -hmm. So that if you get through 
a pass and you never set that flag, you know you did no swaps and therefore the array is already sorted and you can stop. Mm -hmm. And so you can potentially make bubble sort run a little bit faster if you check to see if that flag has been set. So if, yeah. you're, if you're sorting an already sorted array, then bubble sort then just needs to make one pass through the array to determine that it's already sorted and then it's done. You could even set it so that it will change where it starts the second pass. Or change where it ends, because we know that it, it bubbles yeah. up to the top, so we don't need to ever look at that one again. Right, but if you get halfway through the array before it does a swap, why start back at the beginning again? Oh, true. Yeah, so there's, there's all or sorts of optimizations through. you could do to yeah. bubble sort, but it doesn't change that in the worst case, yeah, no. it's still yeah. n-squared. <laughs> yep. You're almost, so when you're doing comparisons of algorithms, you usually look at three numbers. You look at best case, so mm -hmm. how fast will it run at minimum. You look at average case, and you look at worst case. So what's the absolute worst, which is for bubble sort, like an array that's completely in the wrong <laughs> order. Yeah. Um, average case is one that's like, uh, you know, like half the things are out of order. And then best case is everything is out of order. Uh, everything's in order already. Um, so we know that it will take somewhere between n and n squared time to run. For quick sort, um, I don't know what I don't know offhand what the running time is, but I know that because of the having and having and having, um, and the and the rotating things back and forth, um, I think we're still looking at n log n for sorting an array that's already sorted. But the problem with quick sort is that if the array is in the worst possible order, which is not necessarily completely out of order, but just as far as pivoting elements back and forth, um, it runs in n squared time. Oh, really? So the worst case performance for quick sort is actually as bad as bubble sort. Hmm. The, the thing is, is that most arrays are not so yeah. unsorted that quick sort has to degrade to that yeah. poor performance. You know, most uh, arrays of sorting are in random order rather than in specifically worst case order. Mm. Um, so there are other sorts that are like merge sort is always n log n, no matter how sorted or unsorted it is. The nice thing about merge sort is that the best case is n log n, the worst case is n log n, and the average case is n log n. So you know what its runtime is going to be. The problem with merge sort is that you need all these intermediate arrays. Mm -hmm. So it takes up more space in order to do its work. Quick sort is able to do all of its work with just one temporary variable used for the swapping. Everything else is done in place. So the array doesn't have to be duplicated. The array doesn't have to be actually split into smaller arrays. Um, there are other sorting algorithms that are kind of a hybrid approach where they maybe will do merge sort or quick sort until they get to arrays that are small, like maybe three or four elements, and then they switch over to something else like bubble sort. Bubble sort works really well on small arrays. And in fact, when you have really small arrays with like four elements, you don't have to do bubble sort. You just you manually like look at elements and you can just mm -hmm. sort them. Swap them like around. deterministically, like you know you're gonna swap these and these and these and these, and you're mm -hmm. just gonna do it. So, so they might do like a hybrid approach where they switch between different sorting algorithms depending upon how sorted or unsorted the array is. In fact, they may even do one pass through the array just to kind of like get a measure of how sorted it is and then figure out what algorithm to run. So you might be able to make a pass and go like, okay, half the elements are out of order, so maybe quick sort is a good one. Or the, the array is exactly out of order. 100% <laughs> of the elements are out of order, so just reverse the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then be done, right? Mm -hmm. You'll do a lot of what's just called a big O notation or big O analysis when you take an algorithms course. Mm -hmm. I did that in 13, 12 or 13, I don't remember. I think you probably got a little introduction to it. A little bit, yeah. Imagine, just a imagine bit. spending an entire semester on that. Oh, man. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that was complicated. And I wasn't really far into math yet, so, like, logs and stuff. I mm -hmm. just started with logs, and so, yeah, that was, that was interesting. 
Um, so there was one more thing I was going to do, but we don't probably don't have time for it. But that's how how are we going to like sort a bunch of structures? Maybe we'll end up doing that next time. But just to kind of give you an idea is it's going to be more similar to the way we sorted the strings here. Except that what we're being passed in is not a pointer to a character pointer. We're being passed in a pointer to a struct. Yeah, that's what And then said. let's say pointer inside the struct instead. is, well, remember we have our Pokemon over here? Did we, are we, did, so we ended up uh, searching this, right? Yeah, we did the search. We did search. Oh, maybe we can just, maybe we can just stick a sort into this. We got, we got a few minutes. Uh, let's see if we can do that. So this is going to read in a whole bunch of Pokemon, and then it prompts the user to type in the name of a Pokemon to find, and then it does a linear search in order to find that Pokemon. So let's strip that stuff out. Let's have it not prompt at all to search. We're still going to print it out. And we're still going to load in the Pokedex. And now we're going to have it sort the Pokédex in order of, uh, should it go by name, name of Pokémon? Or should we go by hit points? Well, let's go by name. They're all different. Okay, so right here, between when we load in the Pokédex and print it out, we're going to sort it. So we'll call QSort. We're going to pass in the name of the array, which is Pokédex. The length of the array, which is count. The size of each element, which is going to be the size of a Pokémon. And how do I know that? because this is an array of, Pokédex is an array of Pokémon pointers. So each one of the elements in the Pokédex is a Pokémon. And then finally, our comparison function. So let's come up here and let's do our comparison function. P compare const void pointer A and const void pointer B. And then let's just do this incrementally like we did before. Well, let's just cast things first and then we can incorporate the casts in later. So we know that A and B are pointing to two Pokemons. So they are their actual types are Pokemon pointers. Don't you need, because they're pointers though, don't you need to use the arrows? We're just doing cast first. Oh, okay. So now we can say return string compare, because we're just comparing names. And you're right, we'll do AA pointer name and BB pointer name. And like, that's it. Let me just make sure I got that right. So that's a, that's a name there. And then they're in alphabetical order.
Now, if you want to incorporate the, the cast into here, I'm not sure if this will work. No, that did not work, so we just need to put some extra parentheses in there. In this case, the cast has a lower precedence than the arrow operator. So it's trying to follow the arrow before it knows what the type is. There, that fixed it. So an extra set of parentheses in order to get it to do the cast first. <clears throat> That's strange that it, I guess because it's a struct. Yep. For, for the structs, the dot operator and the error operator are like way down on the precedence list. I see. Well, that only took five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> right? So what did we do there? We called QSort, pass in the name of the array, the length of the array, the size of each element of the array, and then a comparison function. And then for the comparison function, still returns an integer. We're passing two void pointers. We need to cast them to be the right thing. And then uh, use string compare and point to the fields that we want to compare. By the way, when you pass in the compares comparison function here, what you're actually just passing in is the address of it. So since we didn't put any parentheses after it, we're not calling the function. Now it's just a, kind of like a variable name. And for functions, the value of its name is just its address. So we're just passing here an address of where this function should, uh, which function we should call. And then when, so what happens inside QSort is anytime it needs to do a comparison of two elements, it just generates pointers to two elements and then calls the function that was passed in. And what it does is it just dereferences the name, puts two parentheses on the end of it, sticks in the parameters, and then calls it. So that's something you can do in C and in some of the languages. And just, just now, in the last couple of years in Java, being able to pass a function or a method into another method. You probably weren't shown that in your 13 class, but you can, you can do that. It's, it's a relatively new thing in like Java 12 or 10 or something like that, where you can pass in names of methods in a certain way. And mm -hmm. it's, it's really useful for um, like, like if you have like a, um, let's say you have a, an array and you want to apply the same function to each element of the array. Oh, yeah. Right? So you could write a function that takes an element of an array or whatever that thing is and then does some kind of transformation to it and then passes the, val the transform value back. And so with this new version of Java, you can basically write a, a loop and you pass in the, the function that you want to apply. In most other languages, it's called map. You can take a, an array and you can map a function onto each element. And so in relatively new versions of Java, you can now do this. That's cool. Yeah, this is great for like generic programming because you can now write a, a generic method that works on an array and then you just pass in the function you want to apply to each element. Hmm. So we could do something like create an array of strings and then pass in a hash function and then it will just take each one of those <laughs> strings and hash them as it goes. Yeah. Right? And just give me a new array that has all, hashes of all those things. That's cool. Or we fun. could reverse that. We could give it an array of hashes and then pass a crack function in and it would crack each one of them as it goes down the line. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, ben says, should we sort pointers to structures instead? Why don't we do that next time? And then you'll be in a good position to be able to do this final password cracking assignment. Because that's exactly what we'll have. Is we'll have an, or one possible way to do it is an array of pointers to structs. And then we're going to sort those structs by just moving the pointers around. And then we'll be able to search that array. Once we get them all uh, organized in order, we can then search them very efficiently. We don't have to do linear search. We have to start at the beginning and go to the end. Once they're all sorted in order, we can do binary search, which is way faster. The way I understand it, binary is, is kind of similar to how quicksort does it, splits it in half mm -hmm. and splits it in half again and in half again. Yeah. yeah. You remember, cool. remember those old dictionaries, right? Big books. Yeah. Right. Now, now you just like <laughs> yep. Google the word, right? But, yeah. but again, Google has the same problem. You know, you type in a search term, how can it sift through its billions or trillions of web pages and find those terms really quickly? And so one way is to, or one technique, is to somehow organize all those web pages in an order that makes it quick to search. So if you've got a list of sorted words for, alphabetically from A to Z, and you want to find, uh, let's say, um, I don't know, guacamole, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you don't know exactly where it is in, in the list. If you could, uh, the human will probably take a guess. Right? It's probably between A and, it's probably in the first half somewhere. But a computer, it's really hard to teach computers to make a guess. In fact, yeah. by the time you get around to teaching the computer to make a guess, you might as well have just... <laughs> it just kind of like brute forced it. Um, yeah. so, so the way the computer would do is it would just look at the middle element and compare that to the word we're trying to find. And if that word we're trying to find comes in the first half, we know we can now just completely disregard the second half. So we've already cut down the size of our list by half. And they do the same thing. Look at the middle element and see whether it's in the first half or the second half. And then disregard the half that it's not in. So you cut it down in half, then a quarter, then an eighth, then a sixteenth, and a thirty-second, until you finally get to the word you're looking for. That's cool. Super fast. Smart people coming up with this stuff, man. We still need lots of smart people. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll do that next time. That's cool. And this is a side note here, or maybe kind of leading to something we might do towards the end of the semester. But um, I just read something a, a little bit unnerving, which is, well, so we're learning how to like crack passwords. And if you take my discrete structures course, we also learn how to, um, to crack like um, encryption. I remember that. And to be able to crack something like RSA, you have to be able to take this big number and factor it into two smaller numbers. And if you can do that quickly, then you can crack RSA quickly. And right now, under classical computers, we don't know how to do that quickly. It's brute force, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some algorithms that can maybe find it a little bit faster, but it's, like, it's not like log n faster. It's like mm -hmm. n over 2 faster or n over 4 faster. The problem is that quantum computers are coming up, and those can not instantaneously, but can now... Uh, maybe find those factors not in log n time, but maybe square root of n time. Which is not quite as fast as log n, but yeah, it's still it's faster. Yeah. Much faster. Much faster than n divided by some constant. So the thing that I read that was sort of unnerving is that there are people right now, hackers right now, that are collecting encrypted data now, knowing that they can't crack it but maybe 10 or 20 years from now, they will be able to. Wow. Change your passwords. <laughs> well, it, it, it's not just that. It's like, imagine like some government like has classified information about mm -hmm. super secret projects that are working on right now. Yeah. And the government will never release that information because it's just top secret. Mm -hmm. But someone's been able to obtain those files that are encrypted and maybe 10 or 20 years from now, they could crack them and find out what the government was doing back then. Hmm. Yeah, that could, 
be bad. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but the unnerving part is we need to be thinking now about algorithms that even quantum computers can't crack, even though we can't actually like do it now, right? Can't, we yeah. can't test it now, but we need to be thinking now about algorithms that won't be able, that, about encryption that won't be able to crack for 20 or 30 years. Right, because eventually we will. Eventually we will, right. And then, yeah. And yeah. so this kind of makes the case for learning about quantum computing like as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. At least getting the basics down so that you'll be prepared for that when that comes. Because mm -hmm. it will come probably in your lifetimes. Yeah. Dur at yeah. least, if not in your lifetimes, then during your um, professional career time. Mm -hmm. which is, for most of you, like the next 30 or 40 years. Mm -hmm. So, just something to, to think about. And so, yeah. that's why I'm like just thinking about, like, can I introduce like an introduction to quantum computing at this lower division, freshman, sophomore level, even though nothing like that yet exists. <laughs> it's really hard for us at our college to make the case for a course that doesn't yet exist. Because <laughs> like, oftentimes yeah. we have to fill out this big long form that justifies why we want to offer this course. And usually it's pretty easy, Like right? Some other college is offering this course. Easy, mm -hmm. right? We can offer the same thing. Or um, there's a professional need, right? There's employers in our area that are hiring people who have these skills. And so we can make a justification that, you know, we need this course to be able to teach people to do these skills, even though no one else is teaching that course. Well, what if no one else is teaching that course, no one has it on their horizons, <laughs> yeah. it's offered at an upper division level somewhere else, so there are people teaching that course, but at an upper division level, which we are not allowed to teach. Mm -hmm. We're not allowed to teach upper division courses, but can we make the case that this ought to be a lower division course? Yeah, it should be. It should be, but who's, who's gonna be the first to do it? That's the thing, it's, it's easy if we're not the first. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if we're not the first, then we can just copy someone else's syllabus and we're done. Yeah. If we are the first, then it's really challenging to convince <laughs> a committee of people that we ought to offer this course. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And so I've, I've expressed my um, frustration at this. Like, you know, we're a fast-moving industry and sometimes we just have to be first. Yeah, that would be a very, very interesting course to take. That would be really fun. Yeah, so I've, I've been playing around a little bit with quantum simulators and stuff like that. Yeah, I remember when we did that. That was a, just that, boy, that was so fun. That couple of weeks or, or even, yeah. a, it was it just was a, a day. week. It was a day. Yeah. yeah. Plug it into IBM's computer. Mm -hmm. Try it on a real thing. But, you know, um, it's getting so popular now that sometimes the wait times to run your program is like hours. <laughs> which, is, which is what it was like back in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> wow. You took your C program. You're, you, you submitted the source code, and then you waited hours <laughs> yep. for it to get run. Wow. Um, so we're kind of like back to that, just because the, the supply of quantum computers is so low. Yeah. But you can run simulators. The simulators are better now. You can run it on your own computer. So it okay. used to be the simulators were perfect, right? You'd get, mm -hmm. the problem with quantum computers is there's a little bit of uncertainty Mm -hmm. in the results you get. So you don't always get 100% accurate results. So you usually have to mm -hmm. run the simulation multiple times and then take an average. And it used to be you ran a simulation and you get perfect results. <laughs> right? 100% this or 100% that. Yeah. Now the simulators are better. You get, yeah, 99% this and 1% that. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. that, that's good that they're better. So they more accurately represent what will actually happen when you run it on the real thing just takes a whole lot more processing power. Uh, to run on a classical computer? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, I mean, so it's either like wait hours on the real one or wait a few minutes yeah. on your computer. Right. I will wait a few minutes and be happy about it. <laughs> this is the third one of these I've gotten during my... Yeah, I've been getting a bunch too. You know, it's neat though, like just the, the basics of what we did in that. I've listened to, so there's there's this podcast I listen to, Ashley Flowers. Um, she does Supernatural. Mm. And it's a lot of it's kind of silly stuff, but they get into these scientific ideas that have to do with like superposition and whatnot. And uh, before that, I would have just been like, eh, that's, that's out of 
I'm not going to try to figure that out. That's out of my league. But then after sitting through what you did and learning about it and then thinking, oh, I could research it, learning more and more and it, mm -hmm. all this stuff, books that I've read that are about it now and they, they use the idea behind it. Oh, it's just such a, <clears throat> you should do that every discrete structures. Yeah, I'm going to try to. Yeah. yeah, that's. And we have more time this semester because there's no exams, right? So. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I gained some days there. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's absolutely true. And, and what I'm hoping will be true as the years go by is that we'll have to learn less and less about the quantum mechanics and the physics, just like to program a computer today, you don't have to know about, you don't have to be an electrical engineer. Mm -hmm. It helps, mm -hmm. certainly, if you have a serious problem, it helps to know what's going on inside the computer and why you're getting this problem, but you don't have to be. Mm -hmm. And so eventually we'll get there with quantum computers. You don't have to take the physics courses and you don't have to take the, uh, you know, the advanced math courses. You should probably still learn your linear algebra. Because <laughs> yeah. Because just like, um, you know, here you still have to know your algebra, you still have to know your binary, you still have to know your mm -hmm. logarithms, and so that's not going to change, I don't think. Mm -hmm. But that the tools will get better yeah. as we go on, and we get more and more where you don't have to think about the quantum bits themselves and how they work, and we can just think about the algorithms up here. But we're still, we're yeah. still down here. <laughs> Uh, that's just, uh, it's, it's mind-boggling that uh, I just read, like, the Intel 4004 processor back in the 1971, I think, had something like 2,300 transistors on it in this little tiny chip. Mm -hmm. And now the new M1 Max Apple chip has, like, I don't know, what was that, 54 billion yeah. transistors and it's capable of doing like 10 trillion floating point operations per second i mean it's just and, and, and roughly you know silicon it's not that much bigger than the original intel chip mm -hmm. and so things are now being squeezed in so tightly on those chips that the engineers do have to think about quantum effects yeah that that's the, the you know the the signal going through this little trace of copper is affecting the one that's next to it and potentially yeah. causing bits to flip. And you have to worry about speed of light. How long does it take data to travel from one side of the chip to the other side of the chip? Boy. Incredible. Things no longer happen simultaneously. If something happens yeah. over here, it takes time for it to get over here. Mm -hmm. I mean, not that much time, right? But to the right. point where <laughs> you can't say, load these two pieces of data into these two things on opposite sides of the chip and have them happen simultaneously. Mm -hmm. One's going to happen first. Yeah. That's... By, by like a fraction of a speed of light, right? Yeah, a fraction you know? of the speed of light, yeah. You know? Yeah, very, very, very small amount of time. Yeah, we watched a video on that in uh, 39 last year, last semester, I guess, about the, uh, it's the Tiger, Tiger something, the new Intel chip, or I guess it's the core. It's the Tiger yeah. Pond or Tiger, Tiger Lake. Tiger it Lake. Ends Lake, yeah, yeah. And uh, Tiger Lake. And yeah, oh, it was interesting seeing the way that they they did that, and then the the um, kind of the schematic of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was incredible! Very very it's cool amazing stuff. what they can do. Yeah, yeah. and then the, the thing the things chug along for hours and days, and without apparently making an error. So <laughs> either there's something in there catching the errors when they happen, and then fixing them. That's what it is. Yeah, they were saying that they they've programmed AI into them now. So as it starts calling these different, as it goes through, if it if there is an error, it remembers the error, and then it won't create that error again, and it just learns on its own. That's crazy. It's just yeah, because <laughs> it'll. They were saying that now it will jump way ahead when it starts a function. It'll jump almost to the end of the function, and then catch the errors that happen through the function if it didn't if it didn't guess right mm -hmm. it'll catch the errors and the next time it does that it'll run those errors so that they're correct and jump to the end of the function so that it's just doing it the like whole building, function up, building up a table of right of return values yeah yeah just unbelievable <laughs> pretty incredible
Um, but the downside of all those quantum effects and, and capacitance and stuff like that, inductance between the, the wires is things like the row hammer exploit. I don't know what that oh, is. Oh, so that, that's like, you know, memory is arra arranged as kind of like a grid, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got like X direction wires and Y direction wires coming in and then where those intersect, that's basically a bit, right? Mm -hmm. But what, what the row hammer does is it, um, because memory is isolated, so this process's memory can't be accessed by this process's memory. Mm -hmm. And so the operating system and the processor work together to make sure that this process can't access the memory of this process. Even though they're loaded in memory at the same time, mm -hmm. um, there's guards set up so that they can't look at addresses they're not allowed to look at. But what Rohammer does is one process will start flipping bits in its memory as fast as it possibly can in hopes that it'll change a bit in another process. <laughs> through this capacitance and inductance of, of the yeah. physical circuits. Wow. And so one possibility is you can get processes that are isolated from each other to communicate with each other that way, if you can predict how those yeah. bits will flip. The other is you can flip the bits over here, cause these bits to flip, and the process of these bits flipping cause these ones to flip also. And so you can potentially <laughs> read memory of, of processes you're not allowed to access. Wow. That's... So So one... Possibility is just get the other program to crash, right? Mm -hmm. If you can get it to crash, at least you know you've got like a little wedge into that program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're getting it to crash in basically a way the programmer didn't anticipate. And mm -hmm. the other is, can you flip the bits so fast that they cause these bits to flip, and then therefore these bits to flip also, and read the data <laughs> off of another process? Wow, that's wild. And so Intel is like, <laughs> uh, I don't know what they're doing in response to this, but basically every processor in the past like 20 years is susceptible to this. Wow. That's crazy. And it's just because of the closeness of it, the yeah. size. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So there's not much you can do about it, really. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I mean, once you get to a certain point, that's that's it. But quantum computers, you don't, I don't think you'll have that problem. Right, because it's a uh, well, maybe because if you're charging the charging the atoms, yeah, then maybe if they're close together, be. you can get this one to one charge. Now you're gonna work about charge. entangled stuff, and yeah, you know. <laughs> that's a whole nother problem. Yeah. <laughs> oh, anyway, um, we need to wrap it up. Mm. I need to do my office hours, and then I gotta go pick up the kiddos because they have minimum minimum days this week. <laughs> that was last week, week before, yeah. week before. I don't remember. Last week, I don't remember. All righty. So next time, we're going to uh, learn how to search. Now that we got them sorted, we'll learn how to search. And again, there's a built-in function for doing that. It gets called kind of in the same way. You pass in the name of the array, the length of it, the size of each element. You still have to pass in a function, but now this is a function that teaches it how to find things rather than how to compare things. Cool. That'll be fun. And then we'll be ready to crack our last passwords. And then we, how many weeks do we have left? Three? Four? Uh, we're in 13th week, so we have four weeks. Four, Three and 14, a half right now. It, 14, 15, 16. Wait, wait, we're in 13, you said? We're in 13, so we're we have 13. three and a half weeks left. 14, 15, 16. Okay, so we'll be able to do networking. And by the way, there is class on Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thanksgiving week. Yeah, but not yeah. on not on not Thursday and Friday, right? But, okay, okay. But yeah, that Tuesday. But Tuesday, yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but some some of my students are like, "Don't we get the week off like we did in high school?" No. <laughs> not quite. No. <laughs> this is the way it was back in the '80s and the '70s. Yep. You only got two days off for Thanksgiving. Mm. And what else? You got um, you got one day off for President's Day. <laughs> yeah. That's how my goddaughter school is. Uh, Thanksgiving is just Thursday, Friday. Yeah, Thursday, Friday. John says, I pay for tuition. I don't want days off. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. I know. I mean, when I was in school, it's like, yay, a holiday. And now I'm a teacher. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I should change my calendar. Because <laughs> the holidays keep moving around, right? Sometimes they're on 14th mm. week, and sometimes they're in 13th week, and sometimes they're in 15th week. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you get some professors that use the uh spring or like the opposite uh semester mm -hmm. and they'll just take the template and move it over and it'll yeah. talk about 
right? So it will be in spring and it'll be talking about Labor Day yeah. or in fall and there'll be something for Memorial Day. Oh, yeah, I do that too. <laughs> I, I don't take my, my calendar from the previous year mm -hmm. because it, invariably I've made changes this semester that I want to mm -hmm. roll into next semester. And if I take the one from a year ago, I won't have those changes in there. So gotcha. I just take the one from yeah. the previous semester, which means I have to change all the dates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes, like in fall semester, we only have one Monday off. Yeah, Labor Day. And then we have Veterans Day, which falls on some day of the week. And then yeah, we but that's always celebrated on Monday, isn't it? Oh, no, Veterans Day. Never mind. I was yeah. thinking of Memorial Day. Yeah, we took, we took two, uh, Thursday yeah, off this time. Thursday, And then yeah. Thanksgiving is only a half week off, but Easter is a whole week off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but they fall at yeah. roughly the same point in the semester, roughly. Mm -hmm. So Can it's just a big a mess. Weeks? It's a big mess. <laughs> That's and, then, and if I have two classes, one running on Monday, Wednesday, and one running on Tuesday, Thursday, then they get out of sync with each other because one had a Monday off and the Tuesday, Thursday class didn't oh. have a Monday off. Yep. So they get an extra class. So sometimes I do something fun that, that extra Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, but then they get re-synced up <laughs> come Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yep. And then they get unsynced. <laughs> <laughs> so they go, they go in and out of sync through the, through the semester, which just yeah. drives me crazy. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, someone on YouTube says, is there an ordered playlist and notes to follow along? No, because I decided to do this YouTube stuff just, what, two weeks ago? Three weeks ago? So I have nothing, like, publicly posted. But come spring, uh, what do we start again? Mid-January? Third week of January? Then we'll start all over again. And you'll be able to follow from day one. Oh, I thought it was February. Oh, no, no, no. You're right, January. Spring. You're right. You're right. That's that was when tutoring started. Never mind. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll we'll wrap it up here. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you. That was fun. Oh, you're welcome. I like it too. <laughs> <laughs> I hope oh. so. <laughs> All righty. Well, we will Take see care. you on Thursday then. Yep. Bye -bye. All right. Bye bye. And I have two streams to stop. I have the Zoom stream, which is. All the people you heard in the background, those are my actual students that are in the class. And then we've got the YouTube stream, which is you folks who are just listening in. Uh, let's see if there's anything posted in chat that I missed. Uh, so I'm looking way back here. Yep. So there was the comment about missing the F get S. We put that in. And then... Oh, yeah, so I'm using an editor called Thea, which is really not an editor you can just go to a website and start using. It's, it's, it's just a platform. It's, a, it's code that you have to drop into in a, a, an existing website. I mean, you could fire up a Docker instance and then use the Thea editor there, so you can do it that way. But the way we did it for my courses is we took the Thea source code and then wrapped it up inside of authentication and um, some frames to be able to display the editor within an outer, an outer frame. So what you're seeing on my screen is that Thea editor being dropped into our existing website. Um, it's, it's basically, it's a Visual Studio Code work-alike. So it's designed to look like Visual Studio Code and in fact works with many of the same plugins. So there's a a plugin marketplace you can go to, and a lot of the plugins you can put in are the exact same ones from Visual Studio Code. The whole, Visual Studio Code is written in JavaScript, and Thea is also written in JavaScript, so they run the same, the same extensions. Where the difference comes in is if something has to run native stuff on your computer. And for Thea, it has to run like on a Linux system, and for Visual Studio Code, it's got to run on Mac or Windows or, or Linux. So there the extensions may be slightly different, but they're aiming for as close to 100% compatibility as, as they can. And then I just found out in the last couple of weeks that Visual Studio Code is also producing their own version of the online editor. So you can now get Visual Studio Code as an online web browser-based editor. Um, but there they make the caveat that the whole thing runs in your browser. There's not a front end and a back end like there is for Thea. With Thea, there's a back end that runs on a Linux server and the front end that displays um, the, the, the user interface, and then it sends data back and forth. With Visual Studio Code, it's going to run entirely in your browser. No back end. 
So it means you'll get the editor, but you can't then run things like compilers and debuggers because those have to run on the actual operating system itself. I'm sure someone will come up with some way to attach a back end to it, but right now in the beta version of Visual Studio Code Online, uh, there's no back end. But you can try it out. I think, uh, what is it called? Uh, VS Code. Dot dev, yeah. This is it. <laughs> it looks a lot like Thea. Um, but this is running entirely in my browser. I get a file browser. You can open a folder on your local machine and edit there. You've got a source code control. And there you can't... Um, you can open a remote remote repository and have it pull stuff information from a remote repository, but you can't do the the um, distributed development where you've got a local repository and a remote repository like you can with a backend. You got a debugger, but this debugger only works, I think, with JavaScript. It says not available in the web editor. We got extensions, and it does have a lot of extensions. So any extension doesn't need a backend. It can run. So this is this is kind of cool. Again, this is not a finished product. I only heard about it in the last couple of weeks. So this is kind of like a beta version. But at least you'd be able to edit, and at least you can save files not only to your local computer, but also to a remote computer. And if you're running on something like the Mac, you, you, there's no terminal that you can open up in here, but you could open up like your regular terminal over here and then do your compile and running on the command line there. You just got to open up a separate window. So you can use the editor, save your local uh, storage, and then open up your terminal and do your compiling there. <clears throat> so not, not as integrated as Thea is currently, but getting close. So I'm, I'm kind of interested to see where, where this goes and how the two projects will kind of, um, I mean, they're not really in competition with each other, right? They is just trying to be like Visual Studio Code. Oh, some just fell in my closet. Um, it would be interesting to see if they end up kind of matching each other in terms of their functionality. Uh, what else we got here? This, yes, big difference in the runtime between quick sort and bubble sort. And then, yes, yesterday I was teaching discrete structures, but today I'm doing C. So Monday, Wednesdays, I have a discrete structures course. And then Tuesday, Thursdays is when I do the C course. And those are the only two that I teach. I used to teach a third course, Java programming. Uh, advanced Java programming. No, not advanced. Intermediate Java programming. So it's not beginner, not advanced, somewhere in the middle. But when the whole COVID pandemic started and we went online, I just cut myself back to two courses and I'm teaching three sections of the discrete and one section of the C. So I've got about 100 students in the C course and about 30 in the... No, flip that around. 100 students in the discrete structures course and 30 in the C course. All right, so I am going to have to end this here. So it's good to see you. I love these questions. Come back on Thursday, or come back tomorrow. So what are we doing tomorrow in discrete structures? We are doing, oh, more finite state machines. I had to think for a moment. And then in the C course, of course, we've been talking about doing this password cracking. So we'll be learning how to uh, sort structures again and then how to search them. Why does my university teach Java over C++? Um, in part because we are a community college. So we're just a two-year college, and most of our students transfer over to a four-year university when they get done with us. And the closest one to us also teaches Java as its teaching language. So we just kind of synchronize up with them. So we're kind of compelled to do Java because that's what our transfer institutions teach and use. I don't think I would wish C++ on beginning students. I think if I had to choose between Java and C++, I'd choose Java 
But if I had to choose between Java and some other language, like Python or, 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 or well, Python, I'd, I'd choose, probably choose Python <laughs> because I think that's a better learning language for someone just starting out. And then switch over to Java or C++ once you've got a couple semesters of that under your belt. Okay, let's, uh, let's wrap it up. I got to take off. I got stuff to do. So um, come on back Wednesday or come on back on Thursday. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Be well to yourself. Bye-bye.